God. Welcome to uh, First Christian Church. If you are a guest here today, I'm Mike. I'm the senior minister here. And uh, you're going to find, hopefully you grabbed one on the way in. But if you didn't, feel free to get up. Go to one of the tables. You're going to find a handout that has some announcements about uh, things going on here at FCC. And on the back of that is a place where you could take some notes on this morning's message. Also, there are directions there for uh, if you want to download our app, the My Sermon Notes app, and you could take your notes right online. Uh, we'd encourage you to fill out one of the connection cards. Those are like located in the uh, pew rack in front of you. Or if you just take a QR, uh, snap the QR on the top of the handout, uh, that'll take you right to an online connection uh, card where you can fill that out. So we just love to know that you're here. Thank you uh, for being with us. Gentlemen, we had a great, great kickoff to our uh, men's breakfast yesterday. We had a good crowd, some wonderful, wonderful food. We had some leftover because a couple of people forgot that it was yesterday. No, just joking, Greg Price. Uh, but we did. We had a really, really good time. The guys were real paused about. So I want you to put it down in your calendar for Saturday, November 6th. Saturday, November 6th. First Saturday month. Ready got a group of guys that uh, said, hey, we're going to cook for that. And I hear they're pretty good cooks. So looking forward uh, to that. Way back in 1969, the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin made an announcement that created excitement and anticipation and hope. After a five-year absence, Major League Baseball was returning to Milwaukee for the 1970 baseball season when the Milwaukee Brewers would begin play in the American League. The day of the announcement, over 10,000 people went to County Stadium where the Brewers would play, and they sat in the seats in silence and in awe and in wonder and in anticipation knowing that soon the field would come alive with the crack of the bat, the chatter of infielders, and the roar of the crowd. You know, good news is medicating, especially when most of the news is bad. And today, it seems like most of the news is bad, or at least the media doesn't like to report on the good news because bad and fear sells newspapers. So we don't hear too much good news. I assume you all heard about the, some more bad news by the way, I assume you heard about the backlog of shipping vessels waiting to find ports to dock in the US so they can unload all their merchandise. There's a shortage of longshoremen and truck drivers and warehouse employees. So this has created this huge log jam in the merchandise transportation sector. And additionally, the actual merchandising of products has been significantly lowered due to COVID-related shortages in Asian countries. So, on top of a pandemic and hurricanes and wildfires and floods and racial tension and high gas prices and a floundering economy, you can now expect to deal with severe shortages of merchandise as we move toward the holiday season. Now, aren't you glad you came to hear some good news? I heard an actual DJ on the radio said this week that you ought to buy your Thanksgiving turkeys as soon as you see them at the grocery store early because there's likely to be a shortage of turkeys in stores come Thanksgiving. We need some good news today, don't we? Well, here it is, James 5.8. Take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near. The coming of the Lord is near. That is good news, and we need good news today. And so James says, take courage. In the midst of all of the difficulties and the problems you're facing, take courage. Stand firm. Keep your hopes high, because the coming of the Lord is near. James wrote this letter to people whose lives had been turned upside down, not by a pandemic, but by persecution. And he wrote this letter to encourage his readers to persevere through difficult and tough times. And you know, hope is essential for enduring the troubles and the challenges of life. Human beings can handle an enormous amount of frustration and delays and even pain as long as they feel that there is hope for a better future. But when hope is gone, people often give up. So James writes, take courage. Other versions translate it, stand firm, or keep your hopes high. 
Either way, you are to stand firm, keep your hopes high, take courage, and the reason is because the coming of the Lord is near. You see, the coming of the Lord is, is, is something that should not just be a thought about what will happen sometime out in the distance, but the coming of the Lord is something that should impact your today. It should affect your attitude and how you view life and how you approach each and every day. So how are you doing with this? Are you keeping your hopes high through all of these difficulties? Are you standing firm and being courageous? You know, the more we learn about hope, the more we realize how essential it is to your spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical health. I once read a magazine article in which the writer spoke to experts in the medical field about hope. Cardiologist who was famous for heart surgeries, he said this, hope is the medicine that I use more than any other. Hope can cure nearly everything. Another doctor wrote, if you lead a person to believe there's no hope, you drive another nail in his coffin. Third doctor wrote, psychiatrists have long known that hope fosters health, both physically and emotionally, and hopelessness can appreciably shorten your life. Hope's important. With hope, you can hold on. With hope, you can take courage. With hope, you can stand firm and move forward in tough times. And James tells us we should take courage and we should have hope. And then he tells us why. He says, because the coming of the Lord is near. Obviously, this is a reference to the second coming of Christ, and that's a promise that is made throughout the New Testament. In Acts chapter 1, after Jesus ascended into heaven, his followers remained on that hillside, and they were dejected. An angel then appears and tells them not to be discouraged, because in the same way they watched Jesus depart, they will see Jesus come again. In his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul writes about the return of Jesus. And he said, the Lord himself will come down from heaven. That's a great fact. That's a great truth, right? But then he says, so encourage one another with these words. What James is saying is the coming of the Lord, the return of Jesus, it has to have an impact on your day today. You can be encouraged. You can stand firm. You can take courage. You can have hope. Why? Because the coming of the Lord is near. That's the theme that that goes throughout the New Testament. And you know, the first generation of followers of Jesus, they lived with the full expectation of Jesus returning in their lifetime. They believed it would happen before they left this earth. Jesus would return. So much so that the Apostle Peter, in one of the letters he wrote, he had to explain to them why Jesus had not returned yet. And it had just been about 40 years since Jesus left them. But yet they were impatient, wondering when's Jesus going to come back? He said he was coming back. And so Peter wrote to them, he said, you know, the Lord's not slow in keeping his promises. Instead, he is patient not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to salvation. And so it says, hey, here's the reason why God hasn't returned yet. Then he adds these words, but the day of the Lord will come. But the day of the Lord, it will come. And we need to live with that truth. And that truth needs to impact how we live our lives and and the, the attitude that we have toward life and the things that go on in life. And so in our text today, James says that our courage and our hope is based on the fact that the Lord's return is near. So what do you feel when you think about Jesus's second coming? Well, maybe you're perhaps like the first Christians. You know, you you have such great anticipation and excitement about it. Or maybe you feel like some of the people that Peter wrote to, and you're like, well, when are you coming back, Lord, as you promised? I mean, it's been 2,000 years already. They were impatient after 40 years. We've gotten a little impatient, of course, after 2,000 years. Or perhaps it's not something you think about very much. I mean, you've got enough challenges and enough trials and enough problems today. You don't need to be thinking about something that's going to happen 
you know, when we don't know when it's going to happen. Or maybe you just, you know, kind of get you a little anxious. I mean, the whole return of Jesus thing, it sounds a little strange, a little bit scary. But what you should be feeling and what emotion you should experience when you think about the coming of the Lord is hope. Because that's the main message of the second coming of Jesus. We ought to find ourselves filled with hope as we think about and we anticipate the return of Jesus and things to get better. Now, of course, no one knows when Jesus is going to return. I mean, only the Father knows that. In each generation of Christians, we all hope that the return of Christ will take place during our lifetime on earth. I mean, it's going to be really cool for that generation of believers. Whoever that generation of believers are, when it happens, it'll be really cool to be still alive and get to see that from this perspective. But the far majority of us are likely not to experience it from the earthly perspective. And although the Bible doesn't tell us the exact time when Jesus will come, we do know that it's coming sooner and sooner, and it's getting closer and closer. In the last chapter of the Bible, Jesus spoke of his return when he said, Behold, I am coming soon. I'm coming soon. Now, you may think, why would Jesus say he's coming soon when it's already been 2,000 years since he said that and he hasn't come back yet? Well, the word soon doesn't mean so much like today or tomorrow or like next week, but it means at any moment. Jesus saying, behold, I am coming at any moment. For 2,000 years, the church has lived in anticipation of Jesus' return at any moment. And we ought to live every day as if Jesus is returning at any moment. It's like you look up to the edge of a cliff and you see this huge boulder that's just teetering on the edge of the cliff, right? I mean, it hasn't fallen yet. And it may not fall today. But as you look at it, you realize it could fall at any moment. This world has been right on the verge of Jesus' return for 2,000 years now. And he is coming at any moment. Now, what we do know about the timing of Jesus' return is that it will be a wonderful surprise. Jesus told us, so you must be ready because the Son of Man is going to come at an hour when you do not expect him. And so you may not be thinking, but here he's going to come, and really it should be a wonderful moment for us. I love what Paul told Titus when he said, we wait for the blessed hope, hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our hope. That's our hope. And we live with this glorious hope of this event that's going to take place, that's going to make everything right. So four times in his letter, James reminds us that Jesus is going to come back to earth one day. Now, I know a lot of Christians, we know that the Bible says Jesus is going to come back soon. But we're not sure that it has any relationship to the problems I'm going through right now. I mean, my, my life's a struggle, man. I've got health problems and financial problems, and we've got, you know, all sorts of different problems. What does an event that's going to happen some, some, some time in the distant future have to do with what I'm experiencing right now? Well, James would disagree with you, and he would say it has everything to do with what you're going through right now. Whatever you're going through right now, if it's a financial thing, it's a, it, it's a health thing, you know, it, it's a pandemic, it's persecution. You know, it's a marriage issue. Whatever it is you're going through, the return of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, has everything to do with it. Listen to what James says in verses 7 and 8. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. See, be patient. That's one impact the Lord's return ought to have on you. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look to the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient, take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near. And so we see several emotions, several uh, attitudes, I think, that, that we ought to display because of the coming of the Lord. Patience is one of them, right? And then eagerly look, or anticipation, that's what anticipation is. Eagerly look, it says there. 
uh, to the valuable har harvest. Then he says patient again. And then he says take courage. And so the second coming, the return of Jesus, is to have a significant impact on our attitude and on how we view life. And it ought to affect us in a positive way to face the struggles and the difficulties that are a part of normal everyday life. Jesus' return ought to be a prominent thought in your mind and a great influence on your attitude, especially during times of trouble, difficulty, and crisis. Now, the first time Jesus came, he came to save the world. But the second time, he's coming to judge the world and to reward those who have followed him. And every day, it's getting closer to the day of his return. And when he returns, what's Jesus going to do? He's going to make all things right. He's going to correct all the injustices. He's going to heal all the illnesses. He's going to judge all those who so pridefully rejected him, and he's going to reward all those who trust him. So James says, when you start getting discouraged about how none of your plans are working out, often it seems that the bad guys are winning in the world, he says, be patient, anticipate, look eagerly, take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near. You see, what's going on right now in our country and in our world and what's going on in our lives, it's not the end of the story. We're still in the middle of the story, somewhere in the middle. We know we're not at the beginning of the story and we know that this isn't the end of the story. We're somewhere in between. The final chapter has not happened yet, but it's been written already. It just hasn't happened yet. And you know, when you're in the middle of the story, it can be messy. It's often confusing, it's perplexing, it's unclear. The future is uncertain. A few weeks ago, uh, Sylvia Norton recommended to me that I read the book, A Land Remembered by Patrick Smith. How many of you have read A Land Remembered? Well, if you have not read that book, you need to, and if you like to read, that is an amazing, amazing story. And it's the story of the settlement of one particular family as they attempted to settle here in Florida. But it's interesting the way the book is written. Chapter 1 takes place in 1968 in Miami. As a wealthy Miami man is driven across the state by his chauffeur. Then chapter 2 goes way back to 1862 when the first, very first of this man's descendants came to Florida from Georgia. And the rest of the book tells the story of the McClavey family and how they went from Tobias McClavey, who was this poor, uneducated man who came to Florida, who he, his wife, and their son faced death every single day and starvation, and they faced all the wild animals and the brutalness of what Florida was like in the 1800s. And how just a hundred years later, a hundred plus in 1968, the McClavies were a very, very wealthy family. Now, I'm halfway through the book, but I do know how the story of the McClavy family, because the author of the book started the book with the end. I mean, chapter one, he tells the end of the story in chapter one, and then he goes back and says, you know, tells the story of how it led up to chapter one. And so where I'm at right now in the book and the end of the book, I don't know what those chapters hold. I haven't read those chapters yet. But I do know how the story ends. Because the end of the story has already been written. And that's what life's like. We don't know what's going to happen between this chapter of the story of the world, you know, and the last chapter of the story of this world. We don't know what's going to happen between now and then, but we do know what will happen at the end of the story. So put your hope in God, knowing this here is not the end of the story. We know the end. We may not know the chapters between now and the last chapter, but we don't have to know it. We may not know where the future is going between now and the end, but we know who holds that future, and we know where that future is going to end. And James reminds us, he, he reminds us about how, like, for example, Job, how everything fell apart in Job's life. But at the end of the story, God comes through for Job. Look at verse 11 in chapter 5. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. 
For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him in the end. For the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. God brought it all together for Job, despite all of the suffering he had to endure. He brought it all together for him at the end. And the promise in the hope of Scripture is that he's going to do the same thing for his followers and for his church. We are assured that if we endure our trials patiently, God will make it all right at the end. For God is full of tenderness and mercy. So how do we prepare for Jesus' return? Jesus said, be ready. What do you need to do to be ready, regardless of how long it takes for Jesus to come back? Well, James, throughout this letter, gives us a number of things to do in preparation for his coming. Now, we've talked about some of these things as we've kind of gone through real quickly over the last four weeks, this short, brief letter. But we haven't talked about these things in context of anticipating Jesus' return. So I'm going to give you six things real quickly this morning that you need to do to prepare yourself and be ready for Jesus' return. Now, they're in no particular order of importance, nor, as I kind of went through this, are they in particular order of how James talks about them. I just picked them out and threw them in there. So... Here we go. The first thing James tells us to do in anticipation of Jesus' coming is take out the garbage. Take out the garbage. Last Sunday, we had family over in the afternoon for dinner. As my wife was preparing for our, our children and their, and their children's arrival, she asked me to take out the garbage. Now, it wasn't overflowing, but it was full enough to take it out. Start, right, with a clean, empty bag. And you know, whenever you're going to have a guest at your house, what do you normally do? You, well, you pick up the garbage, you clean up the place, right? You straighten up, you tidy up, because you want your home to be as nice as possible for your guests. Well, folks, Jesus is coming over, and you want to prepare for that. And so James tells us in chapter 1, verse 21, get rid of all faith, or filth. Don't get rid of faith, I'm sorry. <laughs> get rid of all filth and evil. Keep the faith. Get rid of all filth and evil in your lives. In anticipation of Jesus' return, we all need to do some spring cleaning. And so think about what, 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 what would you get rid of in your life? What would you stop doing? What would you stop thinking if you knew for absolute certainty Jesus was coming back a week from today? What would you get rid of in your life, right? What would you get rid of? I mean, you have one week to clean it all up and get rid of it. What's got to go? You see, you don't want to be ashamed when Jesus returns, do you? I mean, if he does return in our lifetime on that great and glorious day, will it be the most amazing day of your life? Will you be all smiles and filled with courage and excitement to see him? Or will you, because of what is really going on in your life, shrink back from him in shame, embarrassed to face him? Jesus returns during our lifetime. One day we will all stand before him. And I know I don't want to be standing before him ashamed, embarrassed by the things I've done. I want to look forward to that day with excitement and anticipation. I want to hear those words, welcome home, good and faithful servant. So some of us just need to do some spring cleaning and take out the garbage. Second thing James tells us to do, since we know the end of the story, is stay close to God. Stay close to God. He says in verses uh, 5 and 8 of chapter 4, He has placed His Spirit in us so we may be faithful to Him. Come close to God and God will come close to you. You've got the Holy Spirit of God in you. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is within you to help you be faithful to Him. And to help you draw close to Him so He will come close to you. Now, regardless of whether or not we're... we're facing a pandemic or persecution and moving to the climax of history, you know, whether or not Jesus is coming back tomorrow or in some distant time, it's good advice to draw close to God and he will 
come close to you. I mean, that's great advice no matter what you're facing, even if you are in some time of a crisis or chaos, or you're not. Draw close to God. He'll draw close to you. Apostle John says it like this. He says in 1 John, continue to live in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you'll be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Talk about that moment. Are you gonna, are you gonna look with courage, be filled with courage when you, when you see the Lord's returning? Or will you have to shrink back from, from him in shame? because of things you've done. He says, stay connected. Stay close to Jesus. And you know, this is speaking relationally, not physically, of course. You can be close to someone physically, but not relationally. I mean, it happens all the time in marriages, unfortunately, where a couple may be close physically, but it's obvious they're not close relationally. I think a lot of Christians, we're close physically to the body of Christ, the church, but not necessarily close to God relationally. I mean, we come when the doors are open, we're here, we participate. And so we're close physically to the church without being close relationally to Jesus. Well, James says, as you anticipate the coming of the Lord, you need to prioritize your growing relationship with Christ. If Jesus was to come back today, would he recognize you as someone who has been close to him? Or will Jesus seem like a stranger to you? Hmm. He looks familiar, but not quite sure I could place him. A few weeks ago, we had this, um, well, I'd like to call a young couple because they were my age. So anyway, we had this couple uh, that was sitting uh, off here uh, to my right and your left, and I had not recognized them. I didn't know who they were, and so like I normally do, I went up to them and I said, hey, I'm Mike Cassara. I'm the minister here. I said, welcome. Is this your first time visiting? And they said, uh, yeah, it's our first time. He says, uh, I'm Blake. I said, and he goes, I'm Blake Couture. And the name sounded familiar. He said, I know that name. And, and then he goes, I, I graduated a couple of years after you from Kentucky Christian University goes, but we knew each other back in college. And I was like, yes, that's where I know you from. And I haven't had a relationship with this guy in, you know, almost 40 years since I graduated from college. We haven't been close relationally or physically. And so when he was sitting out in the audience, he looked like a stranger to me. And, and I think for some of us, that's almost going to be like when Jesus returns. Someone's going to be like, man, he, I know him. I mean, it sounds familiar, but boy, he just kind of seems like a stranger. And so we need to draw close to God. We need to stay close to God. Third thing we ought to do as we anticipate the return of Christ is allow your troubles to increase your anticipation of heaven. Just allow your troubles to increase your anticipation of heaven. You know, heaven, we know it's going to be wonderful, right? It's going to be perfect. But the time between now and then, eh, maybe not so much. It's going to be marked by trouble and difficulty. James 1 talks about, right? We looked at it, all the troubles of every kind that we experience. But instead of fretting over our troubles and allowing all of our hurt and our pain and our grief to immobilize us, maybe we could use our troubles to increase our anticipation of heaven. Because, you know, God doesn't want us yearning for this world and for this life. The Bible says we're to keep our eyes fixed on heaven and focused on heaven. This world is not our home. And so instead of having the attitude that cries out, why do I have all of these problems and all of this heartbreak and all of this difficulty? We ought to say the day of the Lord is coming at any moment when I will no longer ever experience any problems or heartache. We all love Revelation 21 verses 3 and 4. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He's drawn close to them. He will live with them and he will be there. His, they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Amen. One of those things we know about trouble is this too will pass. Listen, folks, trouble, they aren't forever. Now, sometimes it feels that way, but they're not. And even if they did last the rest of your earthly life, 
you won't have any trouble or pain for the rest of your eternity. I heard it once suggested that one of the reasons God may allow us to experience trouble in this life is so we don't get too attached to this world. I think that's correct. God wants us to live in anticipation of heaven, not in the comfort of this world. So increase your anticipation of heaven through the troubles and challenges of your life, knowing, man, it's only going to get better. It's going to be great when we get there. A fourth thing James tells us to do in anticipation of the Lord's return is this, love others genuinely. Just love others genuinely. James says in chapter 2, you always be doing the right thing if you obey the most important law in Scripture. What's the most important law in Scripture? It's the command to love everybody. And so when you are genuinely loving people, you will always be doing the right thing. Love everybody else as much as we love ourselves. And you know, this one is especially important in our world today. Because our world has just become more and more nasty, hasn't it? More and more hateful, more and more critical. I mean, aren't you tired of watching stories on the news about some idiot who erupts because he has to wear a mask on a plane? I mean, how ridiculous is it getting where people respond and they, and they, and they get in fights and, and it's just crazy the way this world is getting. And of course, you know, social media just fired all that up because we can be really, really nasty, you know, behind, uh, you know, the typewriter. And so it's become less, less loving, less and less patient. World's more biased and more bitter and people are more divided than ever before. And it's just nasty. On Friday, I, uh, I had to get my car wash. I, I went over to the car wash on one right by the old Searstown Mall. And so I you know, paid my way, went through the automatic car wash that they have. And then when you come out, you, you, you kind of make that hook you turn there into the areas where you get to vacuum your car out. And so I pull into the area where I'm vacuuming, going to vacuum the car out. I get out of the car, and one of the employees from the car wash is approaching me. And he says to me, he goes, you know, uh, you're really not supposed to have a bike rack on the back of your car when you go it through the car wash. And I said, oh, I forgot I had my bike rack in the back. I said, I didn't know that. I said, I'll be sure next time to take it off. I mean, I got to admit, I was wondering, well, there were three of you that saw me drive into the car wash, you know, and, and took my money before I drove in there, but that's okay. I said, no problem. So then the guy says to me, he goes, you know, I, I, I'm not yelling at you. I said, I think you are yelling at me. I said, you're actually being really nice about it. I said, no worries. I said, just, it's all good, man. It's all good. And I put my hand on his shoulder, pound. I said, don't just, it's all good, man. But you know what they told me? The, the, the kid, he, he expected me to be nasty. I, he just expected that I have to go and tell somebody. My bo- his boss probably told him, go tell that man, don't come back here with his bike rack on his car again. And he just figured we're going to get in an argument. We're going to get in a fight here because that's the way people are today. You know what Paul told the Thessalonians? May the Lord make your love for one another and for all people. I love this. Grow and overflow. Do you have a growing, overflowing love for people? just as our love for you overflows. May he, as a result, make your heart strong and blameless and holy as you stand before God, our Father. Listen to this. When our Lord Jesus comes again with all of his holy people. You know what he's saying? Your love needs to be growing and overflowing as we get closer and closer to the return of the Lord. And so we need to love others genuinely. And that includes all people. There's nobody that's left out of that. In these divided, nasty, callous days, it's more important than ever that we stand out as God's people who genuinely love others. That we smile at people, that we're understanding with people, that we're patient with people, that we respect one another. That's truly the standard by which we will all be judged. Love one another. The fifth thing, that he says we need to do in anticipation of heaven is to invest in the bank of heaven. (laughs) Invest in the bank of heaven. Listen to what he says in James chapter 2. He says, listen, if you see a brother or a sister and they have no food and they have no clothing and you say goodbye to them, have a good day, stay warm, eat well, but you don't give that person any food or clothing, what good does that do? What good does that do? And you know, in five different passages in James, he makes the point about God's generosity and that if it wasn't for God, we would have nothing. We would have nothing. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. It's all because of God's generosity. We agree with that. 
He then makes the case that God's generosity should then make us generous with other people. And so my question to you would be this, and it's a question I ask myself. In light of what we know about the end of the story, do you really need everything you've got? I mean, do you really need everything you have? Jesus might be suggesting that perhaps you might be able to give some of it away, you know, sell some of it, help people who have a whole lot less than you do. I mean, you think about James in chapter 1, he says we ought to take care of the widows and the orphans. Chapter 2, he says we ought to take care of those who need food and clothing. And so this, this idea is pervasive through James about helping those who are in need. Because God is generous, we have the responsibility to be very, very generous. Every time I give, I become like Christ. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave, so every time I give, I become like Christ. I break the grip of materialism in my life. You know, some people, they want to save all their money because they're afraid I'm going to take care of them. And so they save up this big savings account, and then they make a will that says, when I die, here's how I want you to give away my money. And that's a good way to do it, I'm sure. I mean, financial planners will say that's the best way to do it. Jesus might say, eh, maybe you could do your giving while you're living. This way you'll be alive to see how God uses all your generosity. And so as we anticipate the coming of the Lord at any moment, we need to not only love people, but we need to give to people. And we need to great, break that grip of materialism that holds us so tightly. And then finally, the last thing is this. Be ready to meet the Lord. Probably the most important one. James ends this wonderful letter with these words. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. You know, there are really only two groups of people in this world. There are those who have wandered away from God and the truth, and they're facing death, eternal separation from God, and those who are trying to bring those people back to salvation and forgiveness of their sins. That's it. Either you are, you know, the sinner who was, who, who, who has turned your back on God, or you're the one who's trying to bring that person back to God. It's really only two groups of people that there are. And so what group do you fall into? Have you ever made a personal commitment with, to Jesus? And you, you, you've ever surrendered to him? Said, God, here is my life. I, I want you to be the Lord of it. Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. And so the Lord's returning. We have no doubt about that. It's coming soon. It's going to be at any moment. And we need to be ready and we need to be prepared for that. I've got a good friend of mine. His name's Alan. Alan was a good friend from our ministry uh, in New York before we came down here five years ago. And Alan left on Thursday. His, and he and his family are moving to Montana uh, from Long Island, New York. That's quite the, uh, quite the change. And Alan, his new job starts tomorrow, but his wife's job, she's a doctor, and her job doesn't end until the end of October. And so Alan has gone out to Montana ahead of them, and is going to spend a month out there before he goes home to um, reconnect with his wife, reunite with his wife and his daughter, and they all move to Montana together. And I was talking to Alan uh, one day this week, and he said to me, he goes, you know, I haven't even left yet. And I already can't wait to come back to my family in a month. And you know, anticipation and hope, it's what gets us through difficult, hard times. And the Bible tells us repeatedly, hang on, don't lose hope. Take courage, for the coming of the Lord is near.